Previously on the story of Western philosophy, we learned about Pythagoras, a man who was not a mere philosopher, but a mathematician, a cult leader, a guy with a golden thigh, and the son of Apollo himself. Many of you may have thought to yourselves, this is it. This is a man no one can outdo. But what if I told you that there's another man who could rival the awesome life of the great Pythagoras? His name was Empedocles. Who was Empedocles? Empedocles was born in Agrigentum, the very place Pythagoras started his cult. Fittingly, he joined the cult of Pythagoras, and for a brief moment, everything was right in the world. There was a man of infinite wisdom from whom he could learn, but Empedocles fell prey to a temptation strictly banned by Pythagoras. No, not beans, poetry. Empedocles was convicted of plagiarizing Pythagoras' discourses in his writings and was banished from the cult. This left Empedocles heartbroken. He lost his precious mentor, leaving a void in his heart. But Empedocles carried on, filling that void with none other than Parmenides. Parmenides became his teacher. It is also said that he was mentored by Anaxagoras. After learning all that he could from not one, but three of the greatest minds ancient Greece had to offer, he went out into the world to make a name for himself. He quickly discovered some poor Greeks who were complaining about the harsh wind destroying their crops. This was Empedocles' chance to prove himself. Let's slaughter some asses and use their skin to catch the wind, he proposed. And this worked perfectly. They placed the stretched out skins near the crests and the mountain ridges, and the people chanted his new nickname, Wind Catcher, Wind Catcher. We love you, Wind Catcher. Empedocles, a young bad boy poet, was just getting started. For his next feat, he discovered a woman who wasn't breathing and took her to a doctor who diagnosed her with being dead. Empedocles kept her for 30 days. No breathing, no pulse. And I know what you're thinking. I've heard this story before. He's a disgusting freaking necromancer and you are correct. After 30 days, he brought her back to life. But, but Cody, that's impossible. Fake news, liberal propaganda. Yeah, well, it's your word against the most trusted and respected historian to ever live, Diogenes Laertius. Did Hegel ever bring someone back from the dead? I don't think so. But miracles weren't enough. He needed to prove himself as a man of science to outdo the mentor who banished him long ago. So he went to the local bucket merchant and purchased a bucket. He proved that air was a substance rather than just a void by placing the bucket upside down into some water, demonstrating that it didn't fill with water. An impressive feat. Next, he did fill the bucket with water and spun it around wildly, discovering centrifugal force. Next, he looked at a plant and thought to himself, yeah, these definitely have sex. He knew that the moon shines by reflected light and that light takes time to travel. And for his final act, he came up with evolution. Hey, but what about Charles Darwin? Shh. Look closely at the screen and you will see a fool. Now previously we talked about how people claim that Anaximander discovered evolution with his claim that people came from fish, which was clearly bogus. Empedocles, according to Bertrand Russell, said this, Originally, countless tribes of mortal creatures were scattered abroad and endowed with all manner of forms, a wonder to behold. There were heads without necks, arms without shoulders, eyes without foreheads, solitary limbs seeking for union creatures with bodies of oxen and faces of men. In the end, only certain forms survived. This last one is the result of mixing science with myth and Empedocles cosmology, which we're about to get to. So although it sounds like nonsense, and I think those who claim he came up with evolution are again making a stretch, it is only fair to say that he came up with what could be interpreted as natural selection. But being a wind catcher, a necromancer, and a man of science wasn't enough. He decided to found the Italian School of Medicine. Even though this is less eventful than his other accomplishments, this was a massive step in developing medicine into a proper science. But Empedocles couldn't outshine Pythagoras just being a wind catcher, miracle worker, scientist, and medicine man. He would have to become a philosopher, and every great philosopher needs a great cosmology. He learned from Parmenides that there was no becoming. And so we started there. He said that long ago, there was one unity, like Parmenides' being. But in addition to that unity, there existed two forces, love and strife. Strife was a repulsive force, and love was an attractive one. In the beginning, when there was only one thing, love was dominant. Aphrodite ruled supreme. But one day, strife got the upper hand, and this unity was split into four fundamental roots or elements, water, air, earth, and fire. As the battle between love and strife rolled on, the elements mixed together to form all that is, our little cyclic drama. 
The beauty of this cosmology is that it can be interpreted as a psychological, metaphysical, and physical claim. And now his survival of the fittest claim starts to make more sense. We started as separate limbs and sought unity. This striving towards unity is not only a natural process, according to Empedocles, but also the philosopher's very job. Pythagoras formed a cult that was a more ascetic version of Warphism, which was a more ascetic version of Dionysian worship. So in order to outdo Pythagoras, Empedocles must create a cult even more ascetic than Pythagoreanism. Empedocles' religion taught that in the beginning we were all diamonds in a state of bliss until we aligned ourselves with strife through either murder or perjury. As punishment, our souls were sent to earth to be reincarnated for 30,000 seasons. We would start out as animals and gradually work our way up the reincarnation hierarchy through living ethical lives, until we went from beings to philosophers, doctors, or leaders to gods. Pythagoreans abstained from meat and beans and looked down on sex, so naturally Empedocles took it a step further, banning meat, beans, heterosexual sex entirely, and bay leaves. One of his most famous quotes was, Wretches, utter wretches, keep your hands from beans gives me goosebumps every time. In line with Orphic tradition, we get the story of original sin, but Empedocles added a bit of his own philosophy there, the forces of love and strife forming a very important evolution in this religious tradition. Beyond the law, there is a higher law, that we should act as agents of love. Through this, we can become gods ourselves. Empedocles had accomplished quite a bit by now, so he was invited to a party. At this party, the host proclaimed, Everyone either drink your wine or else have it poured on your head. The next day, Empedocles had the host dragged to court and condemned to death for attempting to become a tyrant. This was the start of his political career. He became a democrat. Now, back in ancient Greece, it wasn't two corrupt oligarchic parties competing for leadership like it is in the U.S. today. No, it was a fight between the rule of the people and oligarchy or tyranny. And one side didn't just swine when they lost, no. They were executed, or if they were lucky, exiled. So Empedocles being a democratic politician was no small thing. Empedocles was such a good democratic politician, he was offered kingship, but denied it in the name of democracy. Empedocles knew by now that he was a man even greater than Pythagoras himself, but how could he compete with a demigod? This led to a brilliant idea. He went into the streets and proclaimed, Greetings to you. I am a deathless god, no longer mortal. If Pythagoras was a mere demigod, then Empedocles would become a real god. Pause. Truthfully, the few quotes we have imply Empedocles was a Pythagoras in all of his life. He probably didn't want to compete with Pythagoras. I've just fabricated this motive to drive the plot forward and make this more of a story. Most of you could probably pick up on that, but I don't want to lead anyone astray, so I'll make it explicit. Deep down, he could have harbored jealousy and resentment for being kicked out of his cult, but I have no real reason for believing that. Back to the story. This can initially be confusing, but as you consider Empedocles' hierarchy of reincarnation, it begins to make more sense. At the top, there are philosophers, doctors, and leaders. Empedocles was all three. The only thing higher was becoming a god. Another story tells about a time when pestilence attacked the people of Salinas because of the foul smell of the river nearby. People were dying and women were having miscarriages until Windcatcher came to the rescue again. He combined two rivers at his own expense, making the water sweet. The people began praising him as a god. This was everything Empedocles wanted. He had finally outdone the man who kicked him out of his cult. He had become a wind catcher, a miracle worker, a man of science, a doctor, a philosopher, a religious figure, a politician, and a god. Now the one thing Pythagoras still had on him was that he descended and returned from Hades. Empedocles knew he needed to do the same, so to cement this god's status, he decided he was going to descend into Hades by jumping into a volcano. Everyone was very excited to see the great Empedocles make this journey of transformation. They were all cheering, jump, 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 do a backflip. So Empedocles put on his magical bronze sandals, jumped into the volcano, and died. Thus our philosopher came to an end. And if you enjoyed this video and are enjoying this series, it would really help me out if you clicked the like button and left a positive comment below. To everyone who has been doing that, I just want to express my appreciation to you guys. It really helps these videos get a little boost in the algorithm, and since I'm still a tiny channel, that's major. So thank you.